land acknowledgement. All Spokane Public Library buildings sit on the traditional homelands of the four bands of the Spokane Tribe of Indians. The Upper Band, the Middle Band, the Lower Band, and the Chihuahua Band. Since time immemorial, the Spokane Tribe of Indians has lived and cared for these grounds, identifying themselves as Squillix, or flesh of the earth. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We show gratitude to the land, river, and peoples who have been fishing, hunting, harvesting, and gathering here for generations. May we learn from one another's stories so that we may nurture the relationship of the people of the Spokane tribe and to all those who share this land. Welcome to our event tonight, Atomic Washington, our nuclear past, present, and future, part of Humanities Washington's Speakers Bureau programs. Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sparking conversation and critical thinking, and it provides many other cultural programs to hundreds of thousands of people throughout Washington State each year. Humanities Washington Speaker Bureau of Presenters visit all corners of the state thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Washington Secretary of State, the Thomas S. Foley Institute for Public Policy and Public Service at Washington State University, and generous private donors. I would encourage you to visit their website, www.humanities.org, to find other events like this one. And we'd like to give a note on civil discourse as well. The Speakers Bureau program is designed to generate an open and honest conversation on many topics, some of which may be controversial. We encourage differing perspectives and viewpoints, but we also ask that everyone treat this topic, the speaker, and each other with respect. Tonight's presentation is on Hanford, and I'm elated that we have Steve Olson here with us to discuss this important location in our state. My novel set at Hanford, called The Cassandra, came out in 2019, and Steve's book, The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age, came out a year later in 2020. Steve invited me to do a virtual event with him, which was a blast, and his book was so informative and empathetic that I honestly read it with some regret, wishing it had been published prior to the Cassandra so that I could have absorbed some of its stellar research into my own fiction. As the New York Times book review says, Steve Olson brings clarity to complex subject matter, and Hanford truly is a labyrinth of complexity, a place to marvel over and a place to fear. And now for a more official biography of Steve Olson. Uh, Steve Olson is a writer who most recently authored The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium, and the Making of the Atomic Age. His books have been nominated in several local and national book awards. Since 1979, he has been a consultant writer for the National Academy of Sciences, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and other national scientific organizations. Raised in Eastern Washington, Olson now lives in Seattle. Please welcome Steve Olson. Thanks, Simon. So it's a it's a real pleasure for me to come to Spokane uh, to give a talk about this book, and one of the main reasons is because I grew up in Othello, so about 120 miles southeast of here. At that time, Othello had a population of about 4,000 people, meaning that we didn't have a grocery, well, we had grocery stores, but we didn't have a clothing store. We didn't have a movie theater. So whenever we wanted to go uh, do things, uh, my parents would put us four kids in the back of the station wagon. You know, there maybe were seatbelts in there somewhere, but they were wedged down in the seat somewhere. And we would drive to Spokane. So uh, we spent plenty of time in Spokane in the 1970s. We would always come up every August to do our clothes shopping. And also for all those years, I had a paper out, uh, a morning paper out, and the papers that I delivered were the Tri-City Herald and the Spokesman Review. <laughs> and it's just great to see that the Spokesman Review on the stands here. I picked up a copy yesterday and, and started reading through it. It's a little heavier than it was back in the day when I was delivering it. You know, those newspapers back in Othello, uh, they, they sort of meant more to me than just, um, just, just some pocket change that I would have. These newspapers from what at the time I considered these big cities were sort of like this promise that someday maybe I could leave Othello and go to go live someplace else and someplace exciting and challenging like Spokane or the Tri-Cities. Uh, as it turned out, I ended up going to the East Coast for college and lived in Washington, D.C. for 30 years. So, so that actually did happen in the end. But 
In the year 2009, my wife, who's not here right now, she's heard this talk plenty of times, so she's going to show up at 6 o'clock. She um, got a job when we were living in Washington, D.C. at the Gates Foundation, and it gave us an opportunity to move back to Washington State. So for me, what I'd, I you know, at that point in uh, 2009, I'd written some books that had done pretty well, and I thought, well, you know, when I get back to Washington State, I'm going to write some books that are about this state that I really just took for granted when I was here. I thought, oh, this is like, like Othello, nothing interesting has ever happened in Washington State. So <laughs> the, way I like to, the way I like to start these talks, and, and I've just gotten wonderful suggestions for this, is with a question for you. Uh, which is, what do you think are the most important events in Washington State history? Now, I have to admit that I have a, a bit of an uh, ulterior motive in asking this question in that I can't decide what to write about next. I'll give away one of the, <laughs> I'll give away one of the answers that, uh, that I hear often, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, but I already got that covered because I wrote this book <laughs> previously. This came out in 2016. This was really, really a fun book to write. And now this book about Hanford, but it really is the case that after this story and after the story of Hanford, I really don't know what to tackle yet. So, so what do you think? Does anybody have a good idea for a, an important, the most important event in Washington State's history? Sure. Yeah, what? Grand Coulee. Grand Coulee. I, you know, I drove past Grand Coulee yesterday. I think that's right, because there never has been a full book written about Grand Coulee. Uh, Tim Egan wrote about it a little bit in his books, but, but yeah, the, whole, the whole story of Grand Coulee hasn't really been told. And it's such an interesting one, too, not only in its connection with, um, with electrification here, but also the Columbia Basin Project, yeah, and the production of Banks Lake, and I mean, that had a huge influence on Othello. Blaine Harden, a writer from Moses Lake, has written a very good book that's a, sort of about the Columbia Basin Project. So, But Grand Coulee, I was thinking about that yesterday. We went for a hike on Steamboat Rocks and then went up to the... Up to the water, uh, up to the dam, and, and I thought that that would make for a good book. Another suggestion. How about the volcanoes in Washington? It's in a very active volcano area. Like all, like the other volcanoes besides Mount St. Helens, and sort of the risks that they pose to us. You know, I never. Th I, Mount Rainier, you know, we consider Mount St. Helens the most dangerous of our volcanoes, but Mount Rainier is actually considered by volcanologists the most dangerous because it, the flanks of the volcano can collapse at any time and do things like wipe out Sumner and, and Puyallup and all those towns all the way to the Tacoma High Flats. It happened just 7,000 years ago. And sometimes that happens without any warning. That, uh, you, you can, that, that can happen even without a volcanic eruption because gases seep up from the interior of the volcano and, 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 and reduce the integrity of the rock that's on the side of the volcano. Well, to get back to Hanford, uh, this is the, uh, one of the points that I make that, of course, had never occurred to me until I started writing this book, that Washington State is the first place in the world where one element was converted in quantity into another element. So you remember the alchemists in the Middle Ages, what the alchemists wanted to do was by applying various procedures involving the Sorcerer's Stone and other things, they wanted to take certain elements that were common and inexpensive like lead and convert them into other elements, gold being the one that they were most interested in. But of course, they were never able to do that for reasons we didn't really understand until the 20th century. But Washington State is the first place where large-scale alchemy took place, where we converted one element into another element in, in large quantities. But it wasn't, we weren't converting lead into gold. We were converting the element uranium into another element, uh, which had been discovered just, just very shortly before that, named plutonium. And of course, the people who were doing that down at Hanford were not doing it to get rich, but because they wanted to use plutonium to make atomic weapons. So here's the building where the, that uh, alchemy took place. This is the B reactor uh, at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. This and two exactly more or less identical buildings were built on the banks of the Columbia River in the and during World War II to, uh, to produce plutonium. Uh, plutonium from Hanford was in the world's very first nuclear explosion that took place in the plains of New Mexico on July 16, 1945. There's a movie coming out by Christopher Nolan this summer that many of us who write about nuclear issues are very interested in about Robert Oppenheimer, the head of the Los Alamos Laboratory. And, I, and from the trailer, it appears as if this test right here is going to be the focus of the movie, the, the Trinity test, it was called, the very first atomic explosion that ever happened in the world. We'll come back to that. 
Plutonium was in the nuclear weapon that was dropped on uh, Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, the Hiroshima bomb used uh, uranium from Oak Ridge and it used absolutely all of the uranium that we ever had. Uh, even when that bomb was being used on Hiroshima, we realized that that was an obsolete design, that they would never build another bomb like that again, that all future weapons would be based on plutonium, on the technology that was used in the Nagasaki bomb. There's a small trigger of plutonium in every single one of the missiles that are in the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal today, like this Trident II missile uh, being launched from a submarine. A trigger of plutonium about the size of your fist it sets off the atomic explosion, the much larger atomic explosion that uh, is produced by what are today called hydrogen bombs. But they really start with a plutonium explosion. And, and that plutonium was all made in this building here in, in Hanford. So this is the man who discovered plutonium. He discovered a, a man named Glenn Seaborg. He was a 29-year-old chemist at the University of California, Berkeley. And he, he was, uh, with two graduate students, he was doing research into the unusual properties of, they were doing fundamental research, he was in the chemistry department there, doing fundamental research on uranium, because uranium was producing very strange signals that nobody was quite able to figure out. And, and a lot of physicists and chemists worked on this problem uh, during the 1930s, late 1930s and early 1940s. And in the course of that research, Seaborg and his two graduate student assistants discovered the, the following, that if you take a, a subatomic particle called a neutron and you insert that into the nucleus of a uranium atom called uranium-238 here, if you remember your high school physics, that's because that's, uranium has 238 neutrons and protons all together. What happens is you end up with something called uranium-239, right, because it has one extra neutron in there. Well, uranium-239 is an unstable isotope of uranium that decays over the course of a few hours into another element called neptunium-239, but it too is unstable, and it decays into plutonium-239. Uh, so you basically have, what, what's basically happened is that a couple of the neutrons have changed into protons. That's the, if, uh, that's the, the explanation for why this occurs. Now, plutonium-239 is also an unstable element, but it's a lot more stable than these previous things. Once you've made plutonium-239, it'll remain around for thousands of years. So you have plenty of time to use uranium-239 to do uh, to, for, for various purposes. As soon as Seaborg, Seaborg discovered this process right here, uh, on a, a, a sort of a stormy, dark night in February of 1941, this research was classified because scientists immediately realized that plutonium-239 could, they realized at the time, be used to build atomic bombs. That the understanding of nuclear physics had progressed to the point where they realized that this was possible. Furthermore, a couple of weeks after Seaborg and his assistants made this discovery, they made another discovery, which is that plutonium-239 is the best material in the universe for building atomic bombs. Uh, pound for pound, you get a more powerful explosion with plutonium than you do with any other element. And that's why we use plutonium as the triggers for our nuclear weapons today. We don't use uranium, and that's why the, the Nagasaki bomb was the future of nuclear weapons, not the Hiroshima bomb. But there was a problem in 1941 when Seaborg discovered this, as scientists considered the prospects of whether or not they could be used to make nuclear weapons which is that you need two things to make plutonium. You need uranium-238, very easy. This could be mined out of the earth. Uh, there's a uranium mine uh, here not too terribly far away from Spokane. And you need neutrons. But neutrons were the problem. In 1941, it was very difficult to make neutrons. Seaborg used this gigantic device at the University of California, Berkeley, called a cyclotron to generate the neutrons that he used to make plutonium. And yet, he made so little plutonium that they actually never even made enough with this device to be able to see it in a microscope. The, the reason that they knew they had plutonium is because of the signals that it was giving off. But they, they just had a tiny, minuscule amount of plutonium that they could detect and separate out. So if we were going to be able to produce enough plutonium to make nuclear weapons, we would have to make some sort of device that would make far, far more neutrons than where it was available in 1941. So all kinds of things had to go right during World War II for nuclear weapons to be ready by 1945 to use against Japan. And all kinds of just astounding coincidences had to take place. And this is one of the most remarkable ones to me. 
1941, when Seaborg discovered plutonium in Berkeley, this man, uh, the most, really besides Einstein, the most famous nuclear physicist of the 20th century, Enrico Fermi, uh, was working in New York on a device that almost incidentally would produce more neutrons than people would ever need to generate plutonium and actually apply for a, a variety of other purposes. It's kind of astonishing that uh, Fermi was in New York in uh, 1941. He won the Nobel Prize in 1939 and went to Stockholm to get the prize with his wife and children. But Fermi's wife was Jewish and Mussolini was starting to enact the anti-Semitic laws that Hitler had been enacting in, in Germany. And uh, so he and his wife and children, after receiving the Nobel Prize and the prize money, uh, departed for New York directly from Stockholm and did not, never went back to Italy after that. And, you, you know, it's a good thing that they did. Uh, Fermi's wife's father was an admiral in the Italian Navy, Jewish, and uh, was deported to the concentration camps during the war and, and never heard from again. So in 1941, Fermi, with another man at Columbia University named Leo Szilard, were working on another unusual property of uranium atoms. A couple years earlier, some, a couple of scientists, three scientists in Germany, had discovered that a, a rare form of uranium, called uranium-235, I won't get into the technical details of things, but if a, if a neutron moving very slowly happens to encounter a nucleus of this rare form of uranium, it doesn't make plutonium, it splits. It does, it does what's called nuclear fission. So you've probably heard of nuclear fission. And what happens is it splits into two separate, much smaller atoms. But when you do that, it releases these, these a whole bunch of extra neutrons. So these neutrons, these neutrons move very fast. And remember I said this was a slow neutron. These move very fast. If you could figure out a way of slowing down those neutrons so that they could split more uranium atoms, you could produce as many neutrons as you want. You could also produce tremendous quantities of energy because this process releases a, a massive amount of energy. By 1942, Enrico Fermi had moved from Columbia University to the University of Chicago. He and all, many other scientists, including Len Seaborg, were gathered together at uh, Chicago to work on the possibility of putting these two things together, to put together the device that Fermi had built, which was originally just called a pile because it was a pile of uranium cubes that were inside this big block with graphite around it. And that graphite was there to slow down the neutrons. And they called this a pile. But eventually we came to know this as a nuclear reactor. This is uh, one of the most famous scientific experiments of the, of the 20th century. In 1942, Fermi uh, uh, built this very first nuclear reactor that was capable of a sustained nuclear reaction where you could split uranium atoms and generate enough neutrons to keep the uranium atoms splitting. He built this, uh, this reactor under the stands of an old football field at the University of Chicago, Stag Field. It no longer exists, but there's a plaque there talking about it. On December 2nd, 1942, he fired up this device uh, to prove that, uh, that, that he could build this thing, a nuclear reactor, and that it would actually work and that he could generate neutrons. And you know, I was a physics major in college and this was always presented to us as, as this uh, profound experiment because uh, Fermi wanted to learn more about the natural world. He wanted to see whether a nuclear reactor would work. And that's all true, but that's really only part of the story. The real reason Fermi had the money and the personnel to build this reactor was because if he could get this small reactor to work, then they knew that the much, much larger reactors that were then being designed at the University of Chicago to make plutonium for nuclear bombs would work. So when this device was, uh, was a successful scientific experiment in 1942, scientists in the United States and really around the world, word got around right away, realized that this was possible, that it would be possible to make plutonium and, and make atomic bombs because of the availability of these nuclear reactors to produce protons, neutrons. So two weeks after that experiment in Chicago, a colonel in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was sent to the West Coast to find a place to build the large-scale facilities that would be needed to manufacture plutonium for nuclear weapons. 
And he was in a plane that had taken off from Yakima, and he'd been down around Boardman looking at a possible site down there. And, and he said in his memoirs that when he flew over the Horse Heaven Hills, just south of the Tri-Cities, and saw this area right here stretching from Richland up to the little town of White Bluffs, it's about 30, 35 miles or so, he immediately realized that this would be the perfect place to put these plutonium production facilities. Because he had this list of criteria that he had to satisfy to be able to build these facilities. They needed cold water to cool the reactors because they already realized these reactors were gonna generate huge quantities of heat so that they would, have to, they would have to have lots and lots of water to cool down the reactors. They needed electricity, and by an amazing coincidence, we talked a little bit earlier about Grand Coulee Dam. Grand Coulee Dam had gone into operation the year before. And you know, when Grand Coulee was built, there wasn't, no one really knew what was gonna happen with that electricity. It was more of a make work project for Eastern Washington than it was, than there was any actual demand for the electricity. But there was a set of high, high tension wires, they're still there today actually, if you go to Hanford, that, that ran from Grand Coulee down to Bonneville Dam right across the site. And they realized, wow, this is, what, this is how we can use that electricity from Grand Coulee is to run these facilities in this site. Uh, there was a train, uh, one, um, the, the uh, old Milwaukee Road has a, has a uh, train line that runs just on the other side of the Saddle Mountains here. And there's a spur that comes down the west side of the Columbia River to this town of White Bluff. So that was a way to to bring all the heavy equipment and chemicals that would be needed to, uh, to generate plutonium. At the time, only about uh, maybe 250 people lived in this little farming town of Richland, 250 lived in this town of Hanford, 250 White Bluffs. There were maybe 1,500 people here altogether. So there wouldn't be a lot of people who would you have to move out of the way to do this. And sure enough, within a couple of weeks after um, um, Fritz Matthias was the name of this colonel, flew over this site. All of these people received a letter saying you have somewhere between six weeks and three months to vacate your properties and we'll, we'll pay you when we decide how much your properties are worth. And the other thing was they wanted a place that was isolated because from the very beginning, people realized that these reactors were gonna be very dangerous devices. DuPont, the company that built these reactors, wrote a memo in 1942 that basically laid out exactly what could happen with nuclear reactors. If they caught fire, if the graphite caught fire, as happened at Chernobyl, or if, they got, if, they, if the reaction got out of control and they started to melt down, they realized from the very beginning it would release immense amounts of radioactivity. They needed a place where not too many people would be killed if one of these reactors blew up. And so that's why they decided to put these reactors in this you know, relatively isolated place in Washington State. Now, Fritz Matthias doesn't mention whether he looked over the Saddle Mountains here and saw the little town of Othello, which at the time had about 2,000 people. That's the town where I grew up. You can see my house on Elm Street right about here, um, 915 Elm Street. One of the reasons I really wanted this cover for my book, even though it's not that attractive a book cover, is because Othello is just 15 miles behind this reactor. This is one of the three reactors, not the B reactor. This happens to be the F reactor. These are the white bluffs of the Columbia River right behind there. There's a tremendous, Sharma's book has a very impressive and interesting climactic scene that occurs on these cliffs right here. I encourage you to read it. <laughs> uh, Othello is about 15 miles behind these smokestacks right here. It's right on the other side of Saddle Mountain. So it's, Othello was actually, I hadn't realized this until I started writing the book, the closest town to the reactors at Hanford of any, of any town in eastern Washington. The, even the Tri-Cities are you know, 30, 40 miles away from, from Hanford. So it's really quite a different situation. Within two years of the decision to site the plutonium production facilities here at, uh, on the banks of the Columbia River, the people had been moved out of the old town of Hanford. You can see some of the remaining trees here. And this uh, construction camp of 50,000 people took shape uh, in 1944. This was the fourth largest city in Washington State behind Seattle, Spokane, and Tacoma. By 1945, this camp was completely gone these people were used to build the reactors, but uh, Hanford was deemed to be too close to these potentially dangerous reactors to continue to exist. So if you go to this site today, or if you're walking on the White Bluffs on the other side and you look across to the town of Hanford here, this, this, this will just be desolate. You might see a few stumps here is all they were doing. And what those guys were doing, my grandfather was actually a steam fitter at Hanford when we were living in Othello. This was in the 50s and 60s when he was working there. But um, the, in the 1940s, they were building these reactors, the B reactor. This is the reactor site right here. These much larger facilities uh, are the facilities the water came out of the Columbia River through pipes up here. The water was purified in these gigantic water purification plants. 
Many of these other things associated with the reactor were safety devices. These, these water towers here were full of water so that if the cooling system failed in here, the water would just flow by gravity into the reactor to try to quench the inevitable meltdown that would, would possibly occur. They were building this device. Now, have people here been to the B reactors? Anybody been to the? Sharma's been there, of course, but a couple people all together. Yeah, you have to go see it. It's an amazing, it is part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. The National Historical Park has three sites, Hadford, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge. And I can say, having been to all three, that uh, this is by far the most impressive. I mean, it's not easy to get to this site, but when you walk into this, this reactor right here, the B reactor, it is, it is exactly the same as when Enrico Fermi came there on September 1944 to start up this reactor and to load the uranium, the uranium fuel, into these aluminum pipes that extend through this gigantic block of graphite to slow down those neutrons. What happens is the workers using this device would push the uranium into these tubes. The nuclear reaction would occur inside the uranium. Some of the uranium would split and generate neutrons. Other uranium would absorb those neutrons and be converted into plutonium. The spent fuel came, comes out of the back of the reactor into a big swimming pool. And then the plutonium is extracted from the spent fuel out of this reactor. That's basically how it works. But at the time, um, no one had ever, well, you, you'll see this in the movie that comes out this summer, it, it, depending on the extent to which the movie is historically accurate. There turned out to be a problem with plutonium, and they couldn't use the kind of weapon that they were going to use with uranium with plutonium. They had to develop a whole new technology that involved taking a, a like I say, about a fist-sized sphere of plutonium, surrounding it with explosives, and I know this is in the movie because I saw it in the trailer, and you set off these explosives and it compresses that sphere of plutonium down to about the size of a tennis ball. And when you do that, that's what sets off the nuclear reaction. But this technology had never been used before and they were very worried about using it in warfare because what if it was a dud? Um, you would be essentially, by this time Germany had been defeated. The only potential way to use this weapon was against Japan, which was well on its way to defeat. But the only way, <clears throat> so anyway, the scientists uh, argued with the military. They said, we, we, we do not want you to use this device for the first time in warfare. It needs to be tested. So it was tested on, um, on the plains of New Mexico on July 16th, 1945. Again, I think this movie, The Summer, will be largely about that. The Trinity test, which I mentioned earlier. A replica of the bomb, which they called the gadget, was placed on this 100-foot tower up here. And uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning on July 16th, that bomb was set off. Now, I've seen many recreations of this process in various movies and things like that. But the best recreation I've ever seen is in episode 8 of season 3 of Twin Peaks. Sharma knows, <laughs> Sharma knows this particular episode because... You know, a lot of you probably haven't watched season three because season two was so bad and you get so bogged down in it. But if you watch all of season three, which is very different than season two, episode eight, which is very bizarre, has the whole origin story of Twin Peaks in it. And it all relates to this explosion right here. So I'm going to show you a clip from that, from that episode. Let's see if I can get this to work. I just couldn't believe this when I was watching this show and this came on. Ah, I will probably be able to see it. It's pretty bright once it gets going. This just comes, you know, in typical David Lynchian style, this just comes out of nowhere. You, you have no idea that this is going to happen, and then this happens. This music is a, uh, a, a modern piece by the Polish composer uh, 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 Nikof Paderewski, I'm getting his name, mispronouncing it right at the moment, uh, called Threnody to the Victims of Hiroshima. In other words, uh, Lynch uh, tried to make this as historically accurate as possible in a variety of ways. And again, this very first uh, nuclear reaction, uh, sphere of plutonium weighed 13 pounds. Plutonium is very dense, which is why it's only about the size of a softball or a grapefruit. 
it's just it's, it's bizarre when you watch this because when you when you study nuclear explosions there's so much about this that's right there's the the blast out here there's the way that this cloud i mean they, they really spent a huge amount of time studying the physics of a nuclear explosion to get this image right We were talking earlier about whether or not this explosion would set the atmosphere on fire and destroy all of humanity. Uh, as we, we were talking about it before the presentation. Scientists calculated that the chances of that happening were low, but Fermi was taking bets on it uh, right before the event just to, to lighten the mood, supposedly. Uh, anyway, this goes on for a long time. So in, in typical Twin Peaks fashion, that scene is extended for about 10 minutes. and and. Um, it's a recreation, yes, a recreation. I, I don't know how Lynch did it. Uh, they obviously spent a huge amount of time on it. At one point, for those of you who remember Twin Peaks, remember Bob is sort of the embodiment of evil of that. He of course sort of comes flying out of the nuclear explosion. It's very, very strange. <laughs> in my book, I followed the experiences of this man at, in Nagasaki. He was a surgeon at the Nagasaki uh, University Hospital, a man named Raisky Shirabe. The bomb was dropped because of a lot of problems that occurred with the bombing mission. At 11 o'clock, it was supposed to be dropped at 8, as in Hiroshima. Uh, Dr. Shirabe was in his office at Nagasaki University Hospital, which is this building right here. He was very fortunate. Uh, in Japan, though the houses are largely made of wood and paper, the schools and the hospitals and, and tended to be built of heavy reinforced concrete because there are so many earthquakes in Japan that they, that they did not want these particular buildings to fall down because they had such concentrations of people in them. And they figured that people in the, the wooden and paper houses could survive. So of course the wooden and paper houses all burned from the explosion. The bomb went off about right here, about a thousand feet above this point. This is the hypocenter of the explosion. Dr. Shrubby was in this building. He, he just happened to be standing behind two of these heavy reinforced concrete walls when the bomb went off, about a half mile away from where he was standing. And as a result, the radiation from the bomb had to, was, was seriously degraded and reduced by these concrete walls so that the dose of radiation that he got was much lower than was received by many of the patients and physicians that were in the hospital at the time. Uh, well over half of the, of the people in the hospital died, either from the blast itself or from the fire, but many from radiation poisoning. Dr. Shirabe almost died uh, a couple of weeks after this from radiation poisoning, but managed to pull through and actually lived a very long life. He lived into his upper 80s and spent the rest of his years studying the effects of this explosion on the survivors in Nagasaki. It remains the, the best data that we have about the effects of radiation on human beings is the survivors of the two nuclear explosions in, in, uh, in Japan. After World War II, the Japanese surrendered one week after this, the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, the second atomic bomb was dropped there. There was a brief window in which it might have been possible for the United States and Soviet Union to agree that these weapons were too dangerous ever to be used and to agree not to build any of them, but that window rapidly closed. And the arms race started in earnest within two or three years. And the United States and Soviet Union started building thousands, just an, a, an, an insane number of nuclear weapons. We had 30,000 nuclear weapons at the, at the peak of the, of the size of the US arsenal. And every single one of those nuclear weapons had to have a plutonium trigger, and therefore we needed a lot more plutonium from Hanford. So more reactors, six more reactors were built uh, after World War II to continue to produce plutonium uh, and, uh, for our nuclear weapons. They're, they were all raided up and down the Columbia River, just exactly like this. They all used the same technology, essentially, except for this one, which had a closed water system, but all the other eight uh, drew water out of the Columbia River into the reactors to cool the reactions put that water back into the Columbia River. That water contained various radioactive substances that got into the food and the fish. These stacks along the way let off various radioactive elements which were blown by the wind downwind. Then there's another process which I sort of glossed over earlier in the production of plutonium, which is that the, uh, 
these fuel rods come out of the back of the reactors, right? And, and those fuel rods have a tiny little bit of plutonium in it. This process doesn't make a lot of plutonium. So you have to chemically extract the plutonium from those fuel elements. This is still done today. It's a major issue in, in both nuclear power and nuclear weapons. It's one of the issues with Chernobyl, actually. So anyway, that extraction process was done in these devices, these were, uh, in, these, in these gigantic buildings here. And if you ever drive over the Vantage Bridge and to the Tri-Cities, you'll see these buildings off in the distance. The workers called them Queen Marys because they're about the size of gigantic ships, or they're called canyon buildings. Because once this thing was built, nobody could go inside of it again, inside the operating part of the building, because it was so radioactive. Essentially, the, the, uh, you would have the fuel elements. They came on a rail line up to this pl high plateau here. They would go into one end of this building. And then through a variety of remote control processes, it was amazingly sophisticated technology at the time, you would have chemical reactions that occur as the fuel elements produced down the length of this building. And a tiny little dribble of plutonium would come out of the back end of that building with which to build nuclear weapons. Now, this process generated huge amounts of extremely radioactive and extremely toxic chemicals because you needed these chemicals to be able to extract the plutonium. At the time, in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, the, the operators of Hanford had no idea what to do with those chemicals, so they decided, well, we'll, we'll just leave uh, that for future generations to figure out what to do. They built 177 of these large tanks in the desert sands of of uh, around Hanford up on this central plateau and just pump the chemicals into those tanks. These tanks had a design lifetime of about 20 years. We just now, 75 years after, more than, more than 75 years after World War II, have started processing the chemicals in those tanks. It's being done in a, in a large building like this and really only a few gallons at this point have been processed. This is a process that this thing is called the vitrification plant. Essentially, these chemicals will be removed from these tanks. They will be, the radiological chemicals will be immobilized inside of glass logs, and then those glass logs will be disposed of somewhere. We haven't quite figured out where yet, but this process uh, will take most of the 21st century and cost us hundred, estimated hundreds of billions of dollars, 300 billion, 600 billion, somewhere between. The, in other words. We're going to spend way more money getting rid of these wastes than were spent throughout the Cold War and World War II building Hanford and operating Hanford. The environmental mess on our hands is uh, just uh, incredible. So that's one aspect of the future of, uh, of atomic issues here and uh, nuclear issues here in Washington State is that we, we're going to be facing this issue for a long, long time. And we're going to need a strong congressional delegation to get us enough uh, funding to be able to, for this process to continue. But after World War II, people realized, of course, that this technology that Fermi had developed, these nuclear reactors could be used to, for many other purposes, even though they were originally designed to produce plutonium for atomic bombs. Uh, from, from a relatively early stage, scientists began to speculate whether you might be able to use them to generate electricity because these devices generate so much heat that if you were able to heat it water, you could put them through turbines and generate electricity. And, and of course, that's the application of nuclear power that most people think of today. This is the Columbia Generating Station, which is situated about halfway between Hanford and Tri-Cities. It's our one operating nuclear reactor here in Washington State. Generates about 10% of our electricity altogether. But once you had a nuclear reactor that produced neutrons, you can basically put any element on the periodic table into a nuclear reactor and add neutrons to it and create radioactive versions of those elements. And you can do a lot of interesting things, and we do a lot of interesting things with those radioactive elements. My son's an environmental engineer, and when they're out on the site and they have a, a pipe that's leaking somewhere and they don't know what it is, they call in a specially trained team of people who Add water to that pipe that has just a little bit of radioactive sodium in it, uh, not, a, not enough to harm anybody. Uh, and then they put that water through the pipe, and in a place where the pipe is leaking, that radioactive sodium comes out of the pipe and uh, forms this big mass. And somebody walks above it with a Geiger counter, essentially. And where they see a lot of radioactivity, that's where they know the pipe is leaking. And so that's where they know to dig down and, uh, and fix the pipes. It's a very common practice. And there are a lot of other underground applications of various uh, radioactive elements. We use radioactive elements in medicine quite a bit. Uh, cancer and various other kinds of tumors are treated with uh, cobalt-60 in, uh, in devices like this. 
Many people have maybe taken radioactive iodine, both as a diagnostic and as a therapeutic for thyroid problems. My daughter's having thyroid problems right now. I wouldn't be surprised if she gets some of these sodium-131 uh, capsules. This is actually a, a radioactive isotope that was discovered by Glenn Seaborg, and he always said he was very happy to do so since it kept his mother alive for 10 years past that, past when she would have died otherwise. Smoke detectors contain radioactive elements. Every, most smoke detectors have a radioactive element in it called americium, uh, which uh, is uh, just a very tiny bit of it. It generates a little electric charge in, in, an, in a little column of air, and when smoke gets into that column of air, it disrupts the electric charge that's flowing through the air that's, that's generated by this little piece of americium and sets off the smoke detector, so that's, that's another place that you have it. But I want to talk about one of the, the last thing I'll talk about is one of the other legacies of atomic issues here in Washington State. About 20 miles north of Seattle is Naval Submarine Base Kitsap. It's on Hood Canal. If you go to Google Maps, I did this experiment just the other day because I couldn't believe that on Google Maps you could actually go to this site and see it, that the government wouldn't block this in some way. Uh, our eight Ohio class nuclear submarines on the west coast of the United States sail out of this base on Hood Canal. In fact, you can see a couple of them I just realized the other day. There's always two that are in, in station here being worked on and having their nuclear, nuclear arsenals uh, regenerated. Washington State has the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons anywhere in the world is at this site. There are about a thousand nuclear weapons that are, that are stored up here for use on our, on our submarines. Even Russia doesn't have doesn't have a single stockpile, which is this size. Uh, each of these, uh, each of our eight Ohio-class submarines has 20 Trident II missiles on it, and each of those Trident II missiles has four to five independently targetable warheads. So the missile goes off, uh, the, the nose cone uh, separates, and then these missiles head off to different cities along the way. In other words, a single one of these submarines can destroy uh, 100 um, hundred Russian cities or wherever, they're at, wherever these missiles might be aimed. And Russ's uh, submarines can do the same to us. One of these submarines could basically destroy an entire country. We have, we have eight of them on the west coast and six of them on the east coast. So, so it was really astonished me. You know, I, I grew up by Hanford, and I'd always been interested in writing about this place. And as I learned more and more about it, I said, "My goodness, Hanford has really, you know, is, is really the central place in this whole nuclear story that we're talking about. It's the first large-scale nuclear reactor. It made all the plutonium in our weapons. We have naval base Kitsap that has plutonium there." Um, I've, I've started to wonder if it sort of gives those of us who live in Washington State and know very little about this, I confess that I knew very little about it before I wrote this book, sort of a, a responsibility to see that these weapons, which could destroy human civilization in an afternoon, I mean, we always talk about climate change as, as an existential threat to human beings, and, and, ex, and climate change is a terrible problem that we have to deal with. And yet, if these weapons were used because of a mistake, because of the saber rattling that's going on now with the war in Ukraine, human civilization would essentially be over, everything that humans have ever created. I mean, it sort of says to me that we sort of have a special responsibility for seeing that these weapons are not only never used, but that we eventually get rid of these weapons altogether. That has to be the final end point, because if these weapons are around, they're gonna get used at one point or another. So that's kind of a bummer note on which to end this talk. <laughs> um, so maybe people have questions that'll be more uplifting. Because <laughs> we have some time, I'd be happy to answer questions. Here's one right here. I'll try to repeat the question. Um, um, I do stuff on, on Facebook. And um, there's this, um, I don't know what it's actually called, but it's glass, that radium glass. I hmm. don't know if you've heard it. That I don't know about a, that. Under a certain light, it glows because they're supposedly rating, uh, you know. I don't, but it sounds like something that certainly could exist. Radium is a radioactive substance, and a dangerous one up here in Spokane, isn't it? Because uh, you actually have quite a few foundations that are built of granite uh, that, uh, that emit radium, and I know that that's uh, much more of an issue in this part of the state than it is elsewhere, but because I don't live here anymore, I know less about it than I should. Yeah, yes? It's actually radon. Oh, it's radon, yes, radium, yes. 
Radium is what is the, is the, uh, is the substance in the granite, but it uh, decays and produces the gas radon, which then has, uh, yeah, which gets out. Thank you very use, much. They use that to make the glass, I guess. That's, it seems to me that I have heard about it, but I don't know anything really about it. Yes. I recall the news surrounding the shutdown <laughs> of the end reactor as some sort of official end to the Hanford operation. What was that actually about? I know all the reactors have these letter designations, but the end reactor marked the end of something. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I should have described that process in a little more detail. So. As I said, we had about 30,000 nuclear, nuclear weapons at the very height of the Cold War, and it was far more than the United States or Soviet Union could ever use in any kind of, in any kind of exchange. I mean, they would just make the rubble bounce, as they say. So it was realized when the Cold War ended in, toward the end of the 80s as the Soviet Union was falling apart that there was no need for these countries to have so many nuclear weapons, that they could very safely and easily cut back on the number of nuclear weapons. And as a result, we, had no we didn't need plutonium anymore. So it was possible to close down all of those reactors at Hanford over the course of the 1970s and 1980s and just use the plutonium that we have. In fact, we have actually have a problem now of having too much plutonium, which is the case with, the, with Russia as well. We don't actually know what to do with all of the plutonium that we generated during the Cold War. It's a very dangerous substance that has to be disposed of somehow, but nobody has quite figured out how to do it. The end reactor is a really interesting story. It's the one of the nine reactors that was used both to generate plutonium and to make electricity. In that respect, it has a lot of similarities to Chernobyl, the reactor that blew up in the Soviet Union. That the, the Soviets also built reactors that, that had that dual purpose. The end reactor was brought back online by Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s uh, when he also was making a lot of threats as, uh, about uh, the possible use of nuclear weapons, threats against the, so the Soviet Union. It was, it was a little bit of saber rattling on the part of, of Reagan for that matter. Uh, the, the end reactor by that time was a fairly outdated uh, technology and it did not run very long. The separation plants had not been used for a while and it was very difficult to bring them back online. In any event, all of that technology that I've showed you up and down the Columbia River was never really used after the 1980s. And so the transition was made then at Hanford from, from what they call production, the production decades, to cleanup. And they've been engaged in cleanup ever since. And that was, you know, for people that pay attention to the ins and outs of things going on in the Tri-Cities, that's been an interesting transition because it's a very different process uh, producing plutonium as opposed to environmental cleanup in the Tri-Cities. Oddly enough, the workforce at uh, Hanford has always stayed just about the same, but we have very powerful congressional delegations, so that's one of the reasons I think that that happens. But yes, the end reactor was the last reactor to shut down, the last production reactor that was used. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one back in the back. We know, I mean, I'm not sure we even would know, but it, how's the containment in Hanford? Um, we know quite a bit about it, actually. The information is public. The funny thing about Hanford is people tend to think that it's, you know, it was so secret when I was growing up in, in Othello in the 1960s and 1970s. We knew that plutonium was being produced there. That had been clear since World War II. But during the Cold War, you didn't ask a lot of questions about it. And there's still an aspect of secrecy that adheres to Hanford, even though it's quite a bit opened up now. I mean, there should be not that much information that we can't access in one way or another. So there's an organization called the Hanford Advisory Board, which sort of keeps an eye on Hanford and how the cleanup is going. And I think they would say that they have pretty good information about not only the state of the tanks and leakage from the tanks, because some of the tanks are leaking, some, of, some tanks have single shells, some have double shells. Some of the single shelled tanks are leaking. They're not leaking a huge quantity of radioactive substances in the groundwater, but they are leaking some. We also know quite a bit about the groundwater cleanup that's going on in Hanford. The Department of Energy has drilled wells down to the water table and uh, draws up uh, water that is contaminated with both radioactive substances, but you know, some of those chemicals, some of the toxic chemicals used to separate plutonium are extremely, extremely harmful. And the Department of Energy assures us that they are getting that before, that they clean up that water sufficiently to put it back down into the groundwater and that it's not contaminating the Columbia River. There's a couple of plumes that they're worried about, but the numbers that they are getting for contamination of the Columbia River are not, not terribly worrisome, let me put it that way. Uh, now, 
When you have all those chemicals sitting around in those tanks, there are nevertheless some very great risks. And the Hanford Advisory Board has pointed this out to Hanford a number of times. Risk number one, a major earthquake. Uh, people hadn't realized at the time that Hanford is built on these earthquake faults. And uh, if there were a major earthquake and those tanks were really breached, then we'd be in trouble because there would be a lot of those substances that would then be in the groundwater. And no one's gonna have a good idea about how to dig all that up and remediate that mess that would happen. Fires is another possibility. You have to be very careful with fires out there in those uh, locations to not damage the infrastructure that is keeping these tanks. So, you know, my son's an environmental engineer, and, and he, he assures me that, Dad, almost anything can be cleaned up if we spend enough money on it. So I think that's probably the case with Hanford as well. We have some previous experience. Plutonium was made not only at Hanford, but when it was decided by the U.S. government that Hanford was too close to Russian bombers coming over the poles that could possibly bomb Hanford into oblivion during, uh, during the Cold War, a, another production facility was set up in South Carolina, and there were some reactors built there, and some of our plutonium was made in South Carolina as well. And they had the same issue, tanks full of uh, extremely dangerous chemicals. They've been dealing with them in a, in a better way than, it's, it's easier at, at Savannah River in South Carolina because they have a better handle on what the tanks contain, and it's, and it's, a, it's a more tractable chemical process than is the one at Hanford where those tanks, are, you know, they have so many different chemicals in them and they've all been jumbled up over the years. I don't think very good records were kept for a while. So, you know, I, sometimes w when I'm also want to depress people, I, I, say, I say, you know, we all look back at those people in the 1950s and, um, and we say, what were they thinking? You know, how could they have just taken all these chemicals and put them in those tanks and assumed that future people would pay to take care of the problem? But then I say, isn't that exactly what we're doing with carbon dioxide? I mean, we're filling up the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and assuming that future generations are gonna be able to both get the carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere somehow and deal with its consequences. So it's not as if that, that mentality is completely foreign to us. It looks like we have about four minutes if any, oh yeah, there's a question here. What was the relationship between Hanford and the reactor facility that was built at SATSA? Oh yes, that's another very interesting story, and I talk about it briefly in the book. There was great enthusiasm in Washington State in the 1970s uh, to create a lot more nuclear reactors here. There were projections that we would need a lot more electricity. Those projections turned out to be wrong. And so, of course, there were plans to build five additional nuclear reactors, um, three at around Hanford, and then two at Satsip, which is a small town halfway between Olympia and Grays Harbor, essentially. And uh, the construction started on all those. I can still remember coming out to Hanford in the early 1980s. Shortly after that entire project fell apart, bonds were issued that were eventually defaulted upon. It was one of the greatest debacles in US financial history. I think it remains the, the largest bond failure in US history. An organization was put together with the unfortunate acronym WHOOPS, which people probably know about. <laughs> Um, whoops, uh, did fail on uh, those things. The, for instance, the cooling towers uh, between Olympia and Grace Harbor are still there. They didn't build the reactors, but they built the cooling towers, which I understand feature in a lot of Hollywood movies. And they have various other things they do with those cooling towers. They stay active, I, is my understanding. At Hanford, only one of the three reactors was built, and that is the Columbia Generating Station that, uh, that is there today. Now, of course, there is talk these days about beginning to build nuclear reactors again at Hanford, small modular nuclear reactors that uh, the designers claim will be inherently safe. Um, that argument is being examined by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to see if it's, if it's true or not. Those reactors, anytime you run a nuclear reactor, you, you generate plutonium. And plutonium, you, you can't really get rid of it. And you remember, it's, it stays around for thousands of years. So you've got to figure out what to do with it. And you can always use that plutonium to build atomic bombs. So whenever, if you can extract it from the uranium it's in. So whenever you think about building a reactor, you have to say, okay, how are we gonna deal with the plutonium that comes out of that reactor to make sure that, that we reduce the risk that these weapons will be used rather than increase them. So that was a long and involved uh, d d uh, answer to your question about those five nuclear reactors in which we ended up with, with only one. Yeah, the United States is not building a lot of nuclear reactors now. Other countries are, China, and, uh, and Russia, I believe, are still uh, have plans, and India have plans to build quite a large number of nuclear reactors. Uh, other countries are starting to deal with their nuclear waste issues in more realistic ways. 
than are we here in the United States. They're starting to make some progress on it. Here, the problem, nuclear waste can be disposed of. As I say, almost anything can be cleaned up if you spend enough money to do it. Uh, the issue is political. Who's going to take it? Would we here in Washington, could we in Washington be paid enough money to establish a large nuclear repository here in eastern Washington where all of the nuclear waste from our 100 plus nuclear reactors could come and be stored for hundreds of thousands of years? We, we convinced ourselves that Nevada would take that exchange, but it turned out that Nevada didn't take that exchange. So we still have nothing to do with uh, our nuclear wastes that are generated from our reactors. They sit in swimming pools and in large metal casks next to reactors, next to the reactors all around the country, and they pose a great risk. If, if those swimming pools ever lost water and one of those, and the fuel elements caught on fire, whew, it'd be a mess. It, it, it would spew radioactivity all over the countryside. So very hard decisions still have to be made about nuclear power in this country. Plus, we don't have time. It takes too long, you know, we need to, we need to get solar and wind going immediately within the next 10 years. And in the next 10 years, we can't possibly build enough nuclear reactors to provide the electricity that we're gonna to need to replace fossil fuels. So people talk about nuclear reactors and I'm not necessarily averse to the idea. They may be a long-term solution if there is a long-term, but, but they've, they've gotta be just part of the solution and not the entire solution, that's for sure. Any more questions? Because it is six o'clock, so maybe we'll quit. Okay, I think we're done, thanks. Thank you.